Recently, Netflix premiered a documentary shedding light on the once highly publicized Indonesian case involving Jessica Wongso. For many Indonesians, Jessica's case remains contentious, steeped in drama, and surrounded by numerous theories. The clarity of the case is muddied, with some feeling that the verdict was predetermined even before the hearings began. Let's take a look at the case of Jessica Wongso, a case widely known as the Coffee Murder. In 2015, after having spent a significant portion of her life in Australia, Jessica returned to Jakarta. She arranged to meet with two of her friends for a casual get-together, something they often did. The trio chose to convene at the upscale Olivier Cafe. Here, Jessica ordered a Vietnamese drip coffee, a favorite of her friend, Mirna. However, the reunion took a tragic turn when, after sipping her coffee, Myrna began convulsing and soon lost consciousness. She was declared dead upon arrival at the hospital, with cyanide poisoning determined as the cause. Suspicion quickly fell on Jessica, who had ordered the drink, leading many to believe she had intentionally poisoned her close friend. But was this the real story? Born on October 9, 1988, Jessica Kamala Wongso hailed from an affluent family involved in the plastic biking materials business. Like many privileged children in Jakarta, she received an education from reputable institutions, including the Jubilee School Jakarta for her secondary education. Passionate about design, Jessica conveyed her wishes to her parents and subsequently enrolled in the Billy Blue College of Design in Sydney. From an external perspective, Jessica's life might have appeared idyllic. However, the reality was more complex. While it remains uncertain if Jessica ever suffered from a mental disorder, a significant turning point in her life was her relationship with Patrick O'Connor. Historically introverted, Jessica had always been reserved, often choosing solitude over socializing. Perhaps that's why she became so deeply attached to Patrick and was devastated when the relationship concluded. Patrick was overwhelmed with messages and calls from Jessica. She was going through a tough time and it seemed like no one, not even her family, was there for her during the breakup. She kept reaching out to Patrick, even threatening to harm herself. While Patrick said Jessica was not in a stable state of mind, others hinted that maybe Patrick wasn't entirely blameless. Jessica's mental health deteriorated between August and November of 2015. On August 22nd, she drove her car into a nursing home. On October 22nd, she tried using barbecue smoke to poison herself. Despite her numerous attempts using various means, she was always saved, thanks to timely interventions by the police and others. On October 26, 2015, the New South Wales Police got a call from Patrick warning them that Jessica might harm herself. He was alarmed by a text from her detailing her intentions. When the police got to her apartment, they detected the scent of burned carbon. Thankfully, they managed to intervene in time. Fed up, Patrick eventually took out a restraining order against Jessica. Even after this, she tried to harm herself on November 15th, but was unsuccessful. It was evident that Jessica was grappling with serious mental health issues, and it seemed like she was on her own in her battle. Maybe all Jessica wanted was to escape her life in Australia. So she thought of returning to Indonesia for some respite. Feeling nostalgic for Jakarta and wanting a fresh start, she hoped things would be different back home. She would be reuniting with Mirna, her close friend from university days. The two had always been tight and had shared countless memories. After completing her studies in Australia, Mirna returned to Indonesia, leaving Jessica to continue her life down under. Soon after, Mirna became engaged to a man named Arief Sumarko, and they tied the knot in November 2015. Everything seemed perfect. Myrna was happily married, surrounded by loving family and friends, and she nurtured dreams of becoming a mother one day. 
Yet, her dreams were tragically cut short. Following a suspected case of food poisoning, Myrna was rushed to the hospital. She was alive upon arrival, but after undergoing a stomach sample procedure for diagnosis, she tragically passed away in the emergency room. Her sudden death devastated all who cherished her. In the documentary, Myrna's father, Edi Darmawa Salian, shared his suspicions about her untimely demise. He found Jessica's behavior odd, especially when she inquired if Myrna had died and if it was because she had killed her. For Mr. Eddy, such an unexpected question was a red flag. Why would someone ask such a thing if they were genuinely in the dark? Further suspicions arose when Mr. Eddy learned about the events at Olivier Cafe from its manager. According to the manager, Jessica had ordered the drink a full 40 minutes before Myrna and another friend arrived. The cafe CCTV footage showed Jessica choosing a seat that obscured her actions from the camera's view. Witnesses in the cafe noticed her positioning her shopping bags in such a way that blocked her table from other sight. As the horrifying scene unfolded and Myrna collapsed, staff and patrons hurried to assist. But Jessica seemed to distance herself from the chaos, gripping her bag tightly. What struck the cafe manager was a comment Jessica made, questioning what they have added to Myrna's drink. This statement, combined with her lack of immediate concern for her friend, made Jessica appear all the more suspicious in the eyes of many at the scene. The decision to conduct an autopsy on Myrna's body became a point of contention among her family and the doctors. Myrna's mother was against the idea of her daughter being opened up, while her father, along with some doctors, believed an autopsy was necessary to delve deeper into the cause of her death. Due to these differing views, only samples from Myrna's stomach were examined instead of a full autopsy. Four days post her passing, Myrna was laid to rest at the Gunung Agung Public Cemetery in Bogor. The media was kept at bay during her burial, which was attended by family and close friends. Those in attendance reminisced about Myrna, known to them as a kind and compassionate person. The suddenness of her death, especially when many had seen her just hours before on January 6, 2016, was incomprehensible to many. So what did the evidence from Myrna's body reveal? The head of the Forensic Laboratory Center confirmed the presence of cyanide in Myrna's drink. The amount found in the glass was alarmingly high, measuring up to 7,400 milligrams per liter, and about 3.75 milligrams was detected in her stomach. For context, the lethal concentration of cyanide is between 50 and 170 milligrams per liter. Soon after these findings, the spotlight was cast on Jessica as the primary suspect. Given that she was the one who ordered the drink first, many believe she was the most likely candidate to have added the cyanide. On January 30th, 2016, acting on this suspicion, the police arrested Jessica in her hotel room. She vehemently denied the accusations, asserting that she had no motive to harm her close friend. While many assume Jessica was gearing up to flee the country when she was arrested, others contemplated a different angle. Could it be that Jessica had merely intended to return to her life in Australia? If her plan was to escape, wouldn't she have left shortly after Myrna's death? Instead, she remained in the country for almost 24 days post the tragic event and even witnessed her friend's burial. The case against Jessica took several turns before it went to trial. Initially, the police presented their case, pointing out Jessica as the main suspect. However, their submission was turned down repeatedly due to insufficient evidence and unreliable statements of the witnesses. The police were persistent, submitting the case files four more times and even extending Jessica's detention to 118 days in the Polda Metro Jaya Jail. They were adamant that Jessica be tried for the crime. Jessica's trial began on June 15, 2016. She was represented by her attorney, Otto Hasibuan, who firmly believed in her innocence, stating that she was accused without solid proof. 
The charge against Jessica was severe. She was indicted under Chapter 340 of the Criminal Code for premeditated murder, which carries a maximum penalty of death. Myrna's father, Mr. Eddie, gave some insights into the relationship dynamics. He recalled an instance where Myrna had strongly advised Jessica about her relationship, which might have upset Jessica and sowed seeds of resentment. He also believed that Myrna, fearing Jessica, decided not to meet her alone and brought a friend along. The testimonies from the staff of Olivier Café where the incident took place were perplexing. They found Jessica's behavior unusual when she arrived, as she looked around and chose table 54 despite other tables being available. However, isn't it natural for someone to scan a place upon entry, either to spot a familiar face or to pick a comfy spot? Forensic evidence was presented by three experts. All concur that Myrna's reactions, as seen on the CCTV footage, were consistent with cyanide poisoning. In a demonstration, one expert showed that adding cyanide to coffee resulted in a color match to the drink Myrna had. Jessica's mental state was evaluated by several psychologists and psychiatrists. They described her as calm, methodical, and sharp, even under intense scrutiny. They did, however, suspect her of displaying narcissistic tendencies, often resorting to deception as a defense mechanism. They also found her behavior in the CCTV footage to be peculiar in certain aspects. But the main component of this case, the cyanide, was where things got murky. Despite all the discussions about it, the actual evidence against Jessica was inconclusive. There was no trace of cyanide found in Jessica's belongings. So, the question remained, if she did poison Myrna, how and when did she dispose of the cyanide? This gap in the evidence led to further examination by another toxicologist who would delve deeper into the case's intricacies. This case becomes even more complex with a revelation from Jaja Surya Admaja, a toxicologist who has experience working with cyanide. Admaja highlights a significant inconsistency in the poisoning theory. Cyanide, when confined, can convert into a gas. If Jessica had poured the amount of cyanide alleged into Myrna's drink, it would have released a gas, potentially harmful to everybody nearby, including Jessica herself. Yet, only Myrna showed any symptoms. Another puzzling aspect is the fluctuating cyanide levels detected in Myrna's body post-mortem. The presence of cyanide increased days after her death, but it was at levels lower than that found in apple seeds. Furthermore, since a full-body autopsy wasn't concluded, there was a lingering question about other potential causes of death. Jessica's lawyer, Otto, raised concerns about possible evidence tampering. He highlighted inconsistencies between the Forensic Laboratorium Center's claim of receiving the glass of coffee for testing and the testimony of the barista from Olivier Café, Johannes, who stated he had transferred the coffee to a bottle and left the glass in the dishwasher. The prosecutor, however, claimed they received both the glass and the bottled coffee. Additionally, Otto also questioned the authenticity of the CCTV footage, pointing out disparities in timestamps and unusual pixelation around Jessica's hand, which some argue was a result of her scratching her hand after spilling cyanide on herself. As for the motive, the police appeared to be at a loss. They didn't have a concrete reason behind Jessica's alleged actions. Relying solely on conjecture and emotion seems unprofessional, especially when the stake is someone's life and reputation. The police heavily depended on circumstantial evidence, such as Jessica's mental health history, her ordering the drink first, and her presence during the incident. Yet, a question hangs in the air. Could someone else, perhaps the other friend present, have played a part in the tragic event? The lack of solid evidence, combined with questionable procedural choices, gives the impression that the case against Jessica is built more on speculation and emotion rather than concrete proof. 
In situations like this, it's crucial to avoid jumping to conclusions and ensure that justice is genuinely served based on verifiable facts and unbiased investigations. From the moment Myrna passed away, the public was quick to condemn Jessica. She was labeled a psychopath, a backstabber, and someone envious of Myrna's seemingly perfect life. There was even a widespread rumor suggesting that Jessica was in love with Myrna and felt betrayed when Myrna married a man. This rumor gained such traction that Jessica found herself having to refute it in court. Despite the efforts of Jessica's defense team, the court's decision seemed set. On October 5th, 2016, shortly before her birthday, Jessica was convicted for the premeditated murder of Myrna Selian. She was sentenced to 20 years with the rationale that her actions caused profound pain to those close to Myrna. Her calm demeanor throughout the trial was taken as evidence of her lack of remorse. In response, Jessica's defense team launched an appeal, urging the court to consider the CCTV footage as unreliable. However, their efforts were met with mockery from the judge and prosecutor, who commented on the legal expenses and extended court proceedings. Jessica became emotional during her appeal, reiterating her innocence and denying any involvement with cyanide. The court officials mocked her emotional state and showed her images of where she'd be imprisoned, commenting that the cell looks luxurious, so she shouldn't be too upset about the verdict. Jessica countered, explaining that the images were of the prison's communal area, not her actual cell. Nevertheless, her 20-year sentence remained after the appeal. The quest for the truth seems ongoing since 2016, with Jessica held in Pandok Bamboo Prison. This case is riddled with uncertainties and overlooked details. Sole reliance on circumstantial evidence can be dangerous, risking unjust verdicts. The Jessica Wongso case will likely remain controversial until a comprehensive and transparent investigation is conducted. That's all for today. Thanks for watching.